Hi, my name's Billy, and today I'm gonna to show you how I made this beautiful walnut box with these graceful curves. It uses a fun technique that can provide some visual interest for your next project. I made several of these star-shaped boxes in the past, and people tend to love them due to the elegant features. I know for this one, I want the bottom to be walnut and the lid to be maple. I grabbed a chunk of walnut from my storage area and laid out the dimensions. In this case, I want the size to be approximately two and three quarters inch wide. I want the long sides to be seven inches long and the short sides to be five inches long. All the pieces were first cut down using the bandsaw. That gives me manageable lumber to mill. I flattened one side and edge on the joiner and then plane the pieces to three quarter inch thick. That seems pretty thick for a relatively small box, but we want to make sure that we have extra room to cut the curved sides. I cut the pieces to their final width on the table saw. I took time to sand the inside face of the box now. It's much easier to sand a board than it is to hand sand the inside of a box. Using my table saw sled and a stop lock, I cut all the pieces to their final length. The box will be held together using rabbits, so I set my table saw blade to about half the thickness of my workpiece. I then move my table saw fence over and set it to the thickness of my board. We're going to use simple rabbits to hold together our box. So I have my long pieces and my short pieces, and we're going to cut a rabbit in the long piece so it houses the short piece. So what I did is I set my table saw fence away from the blade about the thickness of my workpiece, And I put my miter gauge here with the sacrificial fence. I put in a ripping blade, and it's a flat bottom grind 24 tooth count blade. But since it has a flat bottom, whenever we cut our pieces, it's gonna leave a nice flat groove for us. The problem with that is, since it's not a crosscut blade, if we didn't have the sacrificial fence, then we could get a lot of tear out on the back end of it. So what this is gonna do is it gives us something to butt up our piece against. So it'll cut through our piece, through our sacrificial fence. And then when we look at it, we shouldn't have any tear out. I know that I can use a dado stack to make these cuts but it's much easier to use the ripping blade and just make a few passes. Perfecto. I have to make the bottom of the box before I cut the grooves in the box sides. Over time, I found that it's easier to cut the groove to match the thickness of the bottom than it is to plane the bottom to match the width of the groove. Now that I have the box bottom planed, I can cut grooves in the sides until the pieces fit. Again, I simply use a ripping blade for this and move the fence over, making repeated cuts. At this point, I haven't cut the bottom to final size yet. I like to tape my box together and then use the combination square to determine the depth of my groove. I make a mark on each piece, and then I use a ruler to measure the distance. I give myself a little bit of wiggle room for expansion and contraction. I can then use the marks on my ruler to set up my tools and then cut the bottom to size. Gluing up a box like this is really easy. I put glue in my rabbits, and then I like to put a little bit of glue in the grooves that house the ends of the bottom. When wood expands and contracts, it moves widthwise, not lengthwise. A little bit of glue in the center of the groove just helps to keep things aligned during glue up. I just glued up the star box and I want to talk a little bit about glue cleanup with something like this. So you have these little tight corners that have a little bit of squeeze out. And I know one trick that a lot of woodworkers do is they take a straw and they cut it at an angle and that little corner there is great for digging out the glue that squeezes out on the corners inside of your boxes. So I recommend that if you haven't tried it. But another thing that I do is when I'm making interior projects like this, I almost always use hide glue for that. Um, I use type on, uh, type three, stuff like that if I'm gonna do something that uh, is gonna be exposed to water or outside. But something like this, I use high glue for it. And one of the big reasons is it cleans up with water. So I will always keep a spray bottle with water and just grab a paper towel, wet it, damp it, 
and then wipe that out. And I've never had a problem with using the water to wipe high glue and it interfere with my finish. Also, typically with high glue, um, it doesn't usually show up with uh, regular finishes that you put on there. Now, if you stain a project, then any type of glue, if you don't get the glue up, is gonna show through with stain. So you always wanna make sure that Regardless of the type of glue it is, you want to sand and try to get all the glue squeezed out you can up. But just in case you miss a spot, because we all do, none of us are perfect, if you use high glue and then you put on a finish, um, like an oil-based finish, I haven't really had a problem at all with a little bit of high glue being in there and it ruined my project. So if you've never tried it, maybe give it a shot in your next project. I had this scrap of maple that I saved for this specific project. It has some of the most incredible flame grain that I've ever seen. I can use my box to get a rough idea of the size I need. Then I mill the piece down to its final size. I use the box dimensions to determine the length and the width of the lid, but honestly, I don't have to be too precise with this. The box size and the lid will be shaped later. To cut the rabbits in the lid, I did use the dado stack. I set the stack to match the thickness of the box sides. I was then able to cut the dados and the sides of the lid. A sacrificial fence clamped to my miter gauge lets me cut the dados and the ends. Ooh, fits like a glove. To lay out my curves, I'm going to use a stupid simple method. I'm going to bend a stick and trace it with a pencil. I use my pull saw to cut grooves on both sides of the stick. The grooves are just thick enough that some twine can fit inside it. This allows me to wrap twine around the stick and tie it in a knot. I did the same thing on the other side. I made a mark in the center of the stick and on the box. I aligned the marks and traced a line from corner to corner. I did this on all four sides. I'm using a 3 quarter inch blade on my bandsaw to make these curves. If they were any steeper, I would switch to a thinner blade so I can make tighter radius turns. I take these cuts nice and easy, trying to stay outside of my lines. Now here's where the process slows down. Admittedly, sanding a box with curves is an exercise in patience. A spindle sander is a godsend. You can pick one of these up for pretty cheap. I was also shocked at how good the dust collection is with mine. To ensure that the curves are uniform on each side, I rotate the lid. I'll sand the curves on one side, including the edge of the lid. Then I'll flip the lid around and make sure it matches the profile on the other side. The spindle sander is good at removing saw marks, but I'm not good enough to get an even finish with it. I use a small piece of wood wrapped with sandpaper to hand sand the box to 220 grit. I did my normal box flattening trick. I stuck some sandpaper to a piece of plywood and then rubbed the box on it until it was flat. The lid fit well inside the box, so I really focused on removing the saw marks and sanding the lid to 220 grit. At this point, the box is ready for finish and looks perfect, but this is for a client and I need to engrave the bottom of the lid. I put some painter's tape on the lid and made pencil marks to determine the center of the lid. This allows me to line up my engraving with the lines to ensure that the engraving will be absolutely 100% perfect every single time. You know when you dedicate this amount of time to attention to detail, it really pays off with a perfectly finished product. I engraved a little of the box and at this point, everything should be done and ready for finish, with one big exception. Um, it didn't engrave correctly. And hey, it's woodworking and everyone's gonna screw up from time to time and it's, what do we do to fix our mistakes? So in this case, I had this beautiful piece of maple, this flame uh, grain in it that is absolutely gorgeous. And I actually saved this piece specifically for this box and this client, because I knew it would turn out really awesome. And then whenever I engraved the back of it, for some reason, my laser printer uh, engraved it off to the side, even though I had guide marks and everything looked perfect on the computer, the printer head was out of alignment and it engraved it off to the side. So, um, terrible setback for me, but I've got to try to fix this because the client still needs this box. So, this is what I'm thinking. I think I'm gonna to try to plane down this part here 
until it is below where the engraving is. And then I'll see how much material is left off. And I might have to glue another piece on there to salvage this. And otherwise I wouldn't really care um, and I would just make a new piece. But I love this grain so much and I've already cut all of the profile to match the box. So I'm gonna try to salvage this one first. And if I can't, I guess I'm starting over, but hey, thems are the brakes, that's woodworking for you, and all we can do is roll with it. My engraving was pretty deep, but it was worth a shot to try to plane it off before determining if I need to make a whole new lid. Fortunately, I felt like I still had plenty of meat on the lid, so I sanded that section again and gave it one last shot. Does anyone else randomly make sound effects in their shop? No one? Okay. Now it's time for the finish. I'm using a few coats of Armor Seal Semi-Gloss. Gratuitous curly walnut finishing scene in three, two, one. but the lid is the star of the show. Man, look at that grain. I really want to keep this box for myself, but that would make for an uncomfortable situation seeing that someone else's name is engraved on it. I made quite a few of these star-shaped boxes and this one might be my favorite. This flame maple is just absolutely stunning. So hopefully you learned something from this video. If you did, leave a comment below and give me a thumbs up if you like this sort of content. Please subscribe so you can stay up to date on the latest happenings in the shop. And until we meet again, get in your shop and build something awesome.